You know, when, when you don't know, you don't know. OK, because you don't know everything. You got to talk to the people that do. That's why I constantly tell my audience I'm brilliant because I know I'm not. I just listen to those who are and I steal knowledge and wisdom from them, which is an appropriate way to introduce my next guest. He's a renowned political commentator, speaker, minister, author and currently a distinguished university professor at Vanderbilt University. He's been here before and I'm pleased to have him back again. I'm talking about the one, the only my brother. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. How are you, sir? How's everything going? I'm, I'm great, Brother Stephen A. Smith. As, in my neighborhood in Detroit, we said fair, pretty fair for a square, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. But I must tell the audience this immediately. Einstein, when asked why he was able to be the genius he was, he said, well, in his humility, I started a little later than everybody else. My growth was retarded, his words, and therefore I'm able to go deeper. That's what you got in Stephen A. Smith, the Einstein of public media, sports, <laughs> entertainment, uh, politics, and the like. That's who he is, y'all. Just understand what you're dealing with. I, I, I wish I could say that by myself, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. I appreciate those beautiful <laughs> words. Uh, Dr. Dyson, I, I got to get into something that's obviously a serious topic of discussion. I showed you a tweet from Ron DeSantis a few minutes ago. He sent out uh, on Friday where he said he hopes other states follow Florida's lead in eliminating DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, before this bill was even passed last summer. Right. He went as far as to say DEI is, quote, better viewed as standing for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination, and that it has no place in our public institutions. When you hear that, your reaction? Well, it's utterly ridiculous. It's ahistorical. This is why this governor has been at the helm leading the charge to de-emphasize history. I thought right-wing conservatives, to their credit, were invested in history. I thought conservative politicians wanted to keep the government out of people's bedrooms, out of their schoolrooms, to allow the process of education to occur organically. And yet here is a governor trying to ban books, trying to keep at bay history about African-American people, trying to politicize uh, advanced placement in terms of African-American studies, not just African-American history, but African-American studies, demonizing and stigmatizing the very open inquiry that should be the hallmark and the benchmark of education. So the reason DEI exists in the first place, not perfect to, by any means, mm -hmm. but certainly a powerful measure to remedy what was, what's the opposite of diversity? Homogenization. What's the opposite of equity? Inequality. What's the opposite of ex inclusion? Exclusion. So DEI exists because of the history of bigotry, white supremacy, the resistance to the inclusion of African American people. Without DEI, Michael Jordan wouldn't have been what he was on the basketball court because he would have been excluded, and Stephen A. Smith couldn't be the king of media right now because he would have been written out of the laws that permitted uh, him to do so. So when I hear Governor DeSantis, I hear a man who is typical of what happened after enslavement, after slavery, when Reconstruction happened, the biggest voices claiming that giving any sense of support to African-American people were those conservative brothers and sisters from the Confederate who were incapable of acknowledging we got to share the tools of life, the toys of life in the sandlot and the sandbox of life with others we have historically denied. I'm afraid Senator, uh, uh, Governor DeSantis is following in their footsteps. What did you, what did you make of the video that, that you, uh, you watched me play a bit earlier about Clay Travis, who is obviously a right-wing voice right now, former mm -hmm. owner of OutKick, succeeded Rush Limbaugh on the radio show. He's been a guest on this show. We don't, sure. do, we don't agree on a lot of different things, but I respect his opinion, which is what I articulated uh, a little bit early in the show. In most instances, in this particular instance, I thought he was being a bit slick because there's so much historically that he left out in really expressing his point of view and the fact that he completely supported the University of Florida in making such a decision. And clearly he supports Ron DeSantis' decision. What did you make when you saw that video of him saying what he said on his podcast? Look, I'm with you. Um, I appreciate people who articulate their viewpoints with equanimity and poise and can do so, even if I dramatically disagree right. with him. So I can dig Clay in that sense or Char Charlie Arnold. I, I respect their flow as it were. But it's so ahistorical. First of all, when Mr. Travis said that he's against identity politics, bruh, 
Who is the bigger purveyor of identity politics than the history of white brothers and sisters in this nation? Not individually, as a culture. When he says he's against identity politics, identity politics don't become a threat, don't become an issue until the majority identity is threatened or in some way joined by other identities. There's no need to rail against identity politics when your identity is seen as normative, is seen as the thing that everybody must appeal to to universally, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the moment it gets challenged, then all of a sudden there's this railing against identity politics. And then when he talks about race and gender and sexuality and so on and weaponizing them, no, my friend, oh, those things were weaponized in the dominant culture. That's why we have DEI. Read the book by Ira Katz Nelson, When Affirmative Action Was White, mm. a white man himself. And he says that in America, many white brothers and sisters are incapable of understanding they benefited from the very policies they now want to decry. When they want to talk about race and racism and attributing that to African-American or Latino or Latinx or gay and lesbian and transgender people, what they're missing is the fact that they were the purveyors of the very thing they now find offensive. Furthermore, the DEI, the CRT, the BLM, the BHM, the, the, the AP, every other alphabet you can um, generate here were done in response to the history of exclusion by dominant white culture of African Americans and other minoritized peoples in the entire United States of America. So I'm afraid that Mr. Travis just doesn't even take into account that history. I'd have more respect if he acknowledged that history and the persistence, not just history, the persistence of inequities and inequalities now to say I simply disagree with the methodology that's being deployed to try to remedy them. He doesn't see anything necessary to remedy. That's part of the the ahistorical priorities that the right wing has unfortunately generated. Well, ultimately, what you're calling on him, or what you're calling on white America to do, Dr. Dyson, uh, I'll, I'll interpret it for you, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. own what you've done, own what role you've played, and in pontificating or excoriating whatever position you want to, you know, excoriate, mm -hmm. at least acknowledge from an historical perspective where it emanates from before decrying it th later on. I had an issue with Clay Travis because he didn't do that. Right. He talked about how he feels now. He didn't talk about its origin. And to right. me, if you're not owning it, then you have no inclination to change anything. And I think that's what the, that's the point that I was trying to make when yeah. I saw what he had to say. So I ask you this simple question mm -hmm. when they don't defer to history. I'm talking about some of the white folks out there who may right. have this position because certainly not most or not all feel that way, but some of them who have publicly decried DEI, who have publicly decried affirmative action and things of that nature. When you see them do this without deferring or referring to history, right. do you believe that's accidental? Or they're oblivious? Or do you believe it's intentional? Oh, it's quite intentional. You know, you can't be as smart as Clay Travis is. And he talked on that podcast about all the businesses he was generating and how he sold OutKick and so on and so forth. So we know Clay is a smart guy. He's we very know smart. he's capable of understanding what's going yeah. on. You're denying the legitimacy of it deliberately. You're living in what Gore Vidal, the late great writer, called the United States of Amnesia. You are deliberately choosing to deny the history that is ever before you. Let's look at Ron DeSantis. He is trying to ban books. When I say he, by extension, the um, school right. district and so on, is denying uh, books about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and the young lady who at six years old, Ruby Bridges, was attempting to uh, get into school in New Orleans, in Louisiana. So the point is that you are denying the history that you have been victim of and that you have victimized others with. And you are denying the persistence of present practices. It's not simply a historic legacy. When we look at housing, when we look at education, when we look at health care, when we look at the distribution of wealth, when we look at the ability of people to move freely in society who are victimized by, say, police brutality, all of those indices suggest to us that in this day and age right now, there is the lethal legacy of past practices that need to be acknowledged. So you got to acknowledge them not only for history's sake, but you got to acknowledge them so we can remedy the stuff that's going on right now. I, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, they're, they're, 
unwillingness, refusal, whatever words you want to use to defer to history. I don't find that to be accidental at all. No. I think by pointing it out, however, it would buffer their arguments. And I don't think they see that because let's play, let's play the role of devil's advocate here. I'll play that role. Feel right. free to educate me. Cause that's why I've got you on Dr. Dyson. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at, the origin of affirmative action. We know, obviously, uh, what transpired with the Supreme Court overturning uh, things uh, last year because of Title IX of the Civil Rights Act 1964, because Asian applicants had a lower likelihood of acceptance over other students. So once again, to me, that's a shining example of how affirmative action, which was originally intended, intended to address the African-American plight in this country, you have other groups piggybacking off of it or other folks with their issues, whether it's xenophobia, whether it's homophobia, whether it's transphobia, the list goes on and on piggybacking mm -hmm. off of that to address their needs. And as a result, we're at the bottom of the food chain right now as African-Americans. That's how I view it. And I guess I'm asking you this question. When affirmative action was first instituted, the objective originally was opportunity. If I remember correctly, it transitioned to opportunity and access, because what good is the opportunity if you don't have the access? Right. I think where some white folks who obviously decry this situation make a point, and I was pointing this out in my opening monologue, they make a point, is when, they, when we transition to the argument for equal results. Right. Because right. equal results, they're like, wait a minute now, you can't give something to somebody, they got to earn it. And if folks are not earning it and, you know, the folks that are asking for, quote unquote, equal results, then that was the end that they needed to attack and address this issue with the fervor that it deserved. And I don't think some of us saw that coming. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, you give an excellent historical overview. Uh, when Lyndon Baines Johnson and others crafted the policy of affirmative action, it was to address the inequities and inequalities that prevailed, the historic legacy of what came about. And he used the example himself, I believe at Howard University, in a race. It's not good enough to just simply say, okay, now you've been denied access to the race, we're going to let y'all in the race. Wait a minute, they didn't have better training facilities. They've had calisthenics. They've had the ability to have extraordinary insight from coaches and trainers and the like. You know darn well just saying, okay, all of a sudden the barriers are removed. You ain't equal. So the demand for equal outcome and results was not simply trying to blind the process and give a leg up to African American and subsequently white women, because we know historically the legacy of white supremacy prevented the flourishing of black people, but we know affirmative action has benefited to this day, mostly white people through other able people and white women. So let's mostly, not, mostly white women. Yes. Let's not trip like we don't know that. So, right. so it, it, affirmative action is benefiting white folk even around in, in the, through the back door. But my point is that outcomes are critical. When, when you hear conservatives say, oh, yes, opportunity but not outcome, they're saying we're going to just pretend like the history that has prevented you from flourishing is now been taken away and you can compete. And if you don't win, that's on you. No. What we understand is we've got to rejigger the process so that we can build up the training and the opportunity to allow other people to get involved in this, right, in this process of education or in a workplace where they've been denied historic uh, access to goods and services that white folk could take for granted. And let me say this. Sure. If we're going to base, base it on, you know, not outcomes. The outcome was rigged. That's what the history of America is. What do you think Jim Crow is? Rigging the outcome. What do you think slavery is? Rigging the outcome. What do you think inequality in access to education and health? It's rigging the outcome. It is funny to me to hear people who have engineered the outcome to their advantage, so much so that they didn't want Michael Jordan playing in the NBA. Earl Floyd just died about, what, six, seven years ago? Yep. The first player, along with Sweetwater, Clinton, uh, to be able to play in the NBA has died in our lifetime. Why? Because they engineered the outcome to benefit their people. That's what white supremacy is. That's what Jim Crow is. That's what the legacy of inequity is. And let me say this. I teach at the well-known HBCU Vanderbilt. Okay, homeboy cutting up or wherever <laughs> I go, that's where a black college is. Here's the point. I teach my beautiful students, most of whom are not black. 
I teach a lot of white kids. Some of them are extremely brilliant. Some of them are smart. A lot of them are average, and some of them ain't got it at all. Mediocrity knows no race. So mediocre white people have been allowed from the history of this country's inception to prevail where talented others were denied. So it is exactly the outcomes that we seek to be able to articulate an idea of justice and fairness in this country. And people say, how long? I say, I'll tell you what, let's have the attempt to overcome the inequities as long as we had enslavement and call it a day. Now, we know that ain't happening. My point is simply this. Black people and other minoritized people don't look for a hand up and a handout. They're looking for opportunities to exercise their talent, but they're also looking for ways to remedy the historic legacy of inequity that has been imposed on us. And you crippled us. You got to find a way to make the leg better. Put us in the past and let us go forward. And to eradicate the specter of unfairness so you know that when you go into a situation, you don't have to stress yourself with wondering, I'm 50 yards behind and I can't catch up because they're asking uh-huh. me to run at the same speed they gave a 50 yard advantage to somebody else. Before I get to my next question, the impact of affirmative action, viewed from social science, uh, a, a couple of notes here I want to share with you, Dr. Mm-hmm. Dyson, about. Only about 100 schools out of 3,500 higher education education institutions in the United States used affirmative action or race conscious admissions. In 2022, about 95 percent of black college students went to universities that did not take race into account in their admissions program. Taking race out of consideration in university admissions would remove 40 percent of black students from schools where affirmative action matters. Taking alumni status out of consideration would remove about a third of white students from these same institutions. This is from a report. Mr. Alvin B. Tillery, Jr., Ph.D., Director, Center for Study of Diversity and Democracy at Northwestern University. I throw all of those numbers out to you. I throw all of those stats out to you. You brought up the fact that white folks, particularly white women, have been primary beneficiaries of affirmative action. What about the argument white America could make when they say, well, if we're benefiting, why would we want to get rid of it? You're accusing us of doing something that we're not doing because we're benefiting, right? They could actually use that as an argument to support the position that they're really not trying to eradicate unfairness. That They're not trying to eradicate fairness for African-Americans and minorities in this country. And they could use that as an argument. What would you say to that? Well, first of all, they're throwing rocks and hiding their hands. Of course, they're not going to admit that. And they're going to take it full advantage if their wives or daughters uh, uh, female companies are run by them and then they are the major stakeholders, uh, then they benefit from their white wives or daughters or other uh, relatives who are female benefiting from affirmative action policies while lining their pockets as white men. So that okie doke ain't nothing new. Secondly, what's interesting here is that we're talking about the elite institutions, right? So you, the numbers you read, Professor Tillery talked about. Yes. If we remove the, um, you know, the consideration of race, but we're talking about the upper echelon here, the right. top 25, 30, 40, 50, maybe top 50 schools. Well, those are the schools people are trying to get into. Those are the schools, when you look at the uh, Supreme Court, what did, they, what did they graduate from? Yale, Harvard, Princeton, mm-hmm. right? So we know that makes a difference. I heard you today on television speaking, uh, 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 talking about a winning culture. And the Cowboys, even though they're 12 and whatever, won 12 games over yeah. the last three seasons, they don't have a winning culture. So what's interesting here, a culture of lying and mendacity is characteristic of what happens when we see predominantly white institutions and white uh, peoples and organizations talking about sharing the wealth with African American and Latinos. And let me finally say this. When we talk about taking the, the alumni away, they ain't trying to do that. When we talk about the advantages because you got names on buildings and people who have given money, when I understand that process, when we talk about affirmative action again, the leg up has been given predominantly to white brothers and sisters in this country, which is why I say again, read Ira Katz Nelson's book. Affirmative action has been primarily a white thing. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 in his book, Why We Can't Wait, 
said a nation that has done something special against the Negro for 250 years must now do something special for the Negro, whether it was a Marshall Plan and the like. And what Ira Katz Nelson says in this book, When Affirmative Action Was White, the following. He says the GI Bill created the white suburb and the white middle class. What did it give people when they returned from war? Not black soldiers for the most part, white soldiers. They got points on a test to get into school and money, one. They got money to buy a house, down payment for their mortgages and lower rates, two. And they got the access to jobs, three. That's the holy trinity of affirmative action. Affirmative action built the white middle class, built white opportunity. People born on third base trying to tell, trying to tell people they, they hit a triple. No, you have been benefited from practices you now want to undermine because you have no sense of history and your own benefit from it. Well, Martin Luther King brought that up on many occasions. He talked about black folks coming here via slavery, yes. obviously on boats and in chains and what have you. And he talked about white Europeans coming on board, coming into this country and not only were they given the land, but they were given opportunities. They were given right. economic empowerment to position themselves to be more powerful, more influential, more substantive than folks who were marginalized, disenfranchised, and obviously pigeonholed to a very, very significant degree. A yeah. couple of questions before I let you get on out of here, and I thank you so much for your time, Dr. Dyson. You. I'm looking at uh, reading something here, continuing to read that report. Dark money groups have spent the last 30 years challenging affirmative action in college admissions. They're now targeting corporate America. I thought about Ed Blum's, I, be I believe that's the correct pronunciation, right, right. B-L-U-M, Ed mm -hmm. Blum's Alliance for Equal Rights Group announced a lawsuit against a venture capital firm owned by Raven Simone called the Fearless Fund. They claim that the firm's focus on funding black women founders violates federal laws on private contracts. I'm just using that as an example yes. to highlight how folks are talking. Now, these are rich, influential, powerful white individuals who are targeting and trying to systematically go about the position of turning back the clock. Why right. are they doing that? particularly because, in the year 2023, 2024. Because, yes, sir. Because it sells. Because this is the moment we're in. The resurgence of white supremacy. And what we mean by white supremacy, we're not talking about individual white brothers and sisters out here using the N-word or hating on people. We're talking about the conscious or unconscious belief in the inherent inferiority or superiority of one group. And you don't even have to be conscious of that. You just grow up in a culture where you learn that language from your birth. And now people get upset. As you've pointed out, Mr. Blum, and I was on a panel with, the, with one of the co-founders of that fund. Th this, is, this is the explicit expression of the desire of rich white people to make sure black people never replicate them, never get in their position, never have the outcome. Because what we don't know is opportunities can provi provide the space for a different outcome. But you got to give me the opportunity to get involved, to get trained, to learn the lessons, to be mentored by people who know the stuff. Then the outcome can be changed. So they are organically related. But what they want to make clear in this age, when we've seen the resurgence of white supremacy and the viciousness of bigotry, and when particular political figures can run for office despite the harm that they've done to this nation, that shows you that the interest here is about the preservation of a certain arena of white privilege that shall go unchallenged. And so, so the country be damned. Yes. So you're saying the country be damned because we all know that as a society, we're only as good as our weakest link. And if you're just willing to throw people out with the bathwater and just throw them by the wayside and disregard their needs, their wants, their desires, their aspirations, et cetera, et cetera, that helps uplift us as a society. What you sound, what it sounds like you're saying is those particular individuals you just specifically deferred to, they don't give a damn. They Whatever it takes for white preservation is what they're after. Is that That's what you're saying? You said it much more brilliantly than I did and more clearly. And yes, that is the point. They do. They are not the true patriots they claim to be. Right. This is what we saw on January 6th. Wait a minute. I thought y'all were patriots. You got a banner of Confederacy being drugged through the most sacred civic ground, arguably in American political life mm -hmm. in the U.S. Capitol. You were putting your feet up on chairs. I thought you liked these people. Even Mike Pence, the vice president, who's conservative as they come, was vulnerable that day because the real interest is not democracy. It's the preservation of whiteness. The real religion in America is whiteness, not democracy. Black people 
brown people, minoritized people, marginalized people have upheld the tradition of democracy. And without us, this country would not be what it is today. That is exactly what I'm saying. So is Ron DeSantis, because we, we started out this conversation by bringing up the governor of Florida. Right. And of course, Clay Travis, who's a very influential voice, particularly mm -hmm. in conservative talk, radio, podcasting and beyond. Uh, like I said, he's been a guest on this show. Sure. I respect his positions. I don't I don't disagree. I don't agree with them most of the time. I'm here to tell right. you, but he certainly has a right to feel what he feels. Am I to lump him in the same category as a Ron DeSantis, are we to separate the two since those were the two names that basically provoked this conversation along with the University of Florida's position on DEI? Do you lump them all in the same bowl or do you compartmentalize and differentiate them in any way, Dr. Dyson? Well, there are ways to do so, but it seems to me that they are in complete agreement here. Ron DeSantis's tweet that you read and Clay Travis's um, argument that I want it done everywhere. Of course, they're in the same boat, making the same argument, because both of them resent the specter of progress among African American and other minoritized populations. How else can we say it? Because if they weren't, they would understand the historic legacy of inequality. Neither mm -hmm. of them speak about that. They don't talk about enslavement or Jim Crow or the historic legacy of inequity right now. All they're talking about is it's unfair, it's unfair, without speaking about the historic legacy that shaped our conception of what's fair and not fair in this country. Heck yeah, they're in the same boat. They're paddling with the same paddle in the same ocean of water. Well, what about somebody like a Roland Martin that, that wrote the book White Fear? Is mm -hmm. it possible that it's as simplistic as that? You look at the open borders. You look at the millions of migrants that have come into this country over the last few years under the Biden, under the Biden administration, because we know that Obama was, was not letting folks stay here. He sent over 3 million you know, migrants back to where they came from, no doubt about that. When you talk about white fear, is is it possible that it is as simplistic as that, that a society in America that was once about 85 to 87 percent of the American population is now at approximately 60 and dipping with each passing year, while the proliferation of other races, particularly the Hispanic populace, is, is growing and growing and growing before their very eyes? Could it just be something as simple as white fear? There's no question that that is a central part of it. Fear of the unknown, fear of what they will do, and fear that they will treat us like we treated them. Fear that the people that we now are minorities to will somehow rise up and be as vicious and as unprincipled as we have been. But we look at the history and legacy of black struggle. We ain't never been that people. Look, never. you can go into a church and kill nine people, and before their bodies are dead, yes, sir, before their bodies are dead, we are forgiving you. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, that's who black people are. So yes, there's a fear, but here's the point. The fear they have about the immigrant, the other, the foreigner, that's the same fear they had about us. They had rules where we were breaking their striking um, practices in the early part of the 19th century, and we were coming in, and we were seen as jacklegs, and we were seen as bootleg, and we were seen as somehow undermining the white economy. The same fear, I would remind black people, who would dare join in this xenophobic Xenophobic passion being expressed presently is the same fear they had against us. Never forget that. Emmett Smith starred at the University of Florida, absolutely appalled at their position, spoke out against it. I think Roland Martin said to me that uh, he thought his son transferred from the University of Florida. That's a former athlete, former all-world athlete, retired as the leading Russian in NFL history. That kind of athlete uh, ultimately departing. I think his son transferred to Texas A&M. What right. do you make of that? I think Emmitt Smith's position. I think Emmitt Smith is righteous. And Emmitt Smith is not a, a you know, left-wing, uh, flaming progressive. Emmitt Smith is played for the Cowboys, America's team. But Emmitt Smith is a man of conscience. He understands that his bread is buttered in a certain way. And he understands without that opportunity, without the ability to engage in his craft, in a sport, where, by the way, they always make exceptions for athletes. These black athletes had 
you know, yeah. some grade point averages that weren't measuring up to what the school was. Well, we but we need them. Had, but we, they, 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 they made money. They had billions of dollars coming in collectively. So my point is, Emmett Smith is a righteous man who understands that I will take a stand. Like earlier members of athletic generations, whether Muhammad Ali or Wilma Rudolph or Althea Gibson or Jim Brown, in this day and age, or LeBron James in our day and age, this is what athletes must do in order to articulate their consolidation of interests that are important, also their solidarity with the very people from whom they come. Dr. Dyson, I think that the athletes that stood arms locked over the George Floyd murder, mm -hmm. over the Trayvon Martin killing, yeah. along with various other issues, there was no killing here. We understand it wasn't a specific human being that was, was murdered or anything like that. Right. But this is a heightened, a highly sensitive issue that's pertinent, that resonates throughout various communities, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, and beyond in this country. I think if there was ever a time for athletes to lock arms on a particular issue, it would be something like this. To that you say what? I say amen. And not only them. That's a great point you, you, you're making because it's not as sexy as George Floyd dying. No disrespect to Mr. Yeah. Floyd. It's not as sexy as something that is dramatic. This is what it is, though. It's the mainstreaming of a certain kind of prejudice. It's mm -hmm. the mainstreaming and normalization of ideas. And we've seen this over the last, since 2016. Let me leave it there. So we understand what's going on here. But white athletes of conscience must speak up, too. We must have the voices of those others who say we benefit from diversity when I got a linebacker out here protecting me or a DB who's looking out for me or a shooting guard. You have benefited from the practices of black diversity implicitly. Now you stand up and lock arms with your mm -hmm. brothers and sisters who are in these positions being assaulted unfairly and unjustly. What about black conservatives out there who will join with the likes of a Clay Travis, a Ron DeSantis, uh, and Ed Blum, and others on an issue uh, like this. What do what does a Dr. Michael Eric Dyson and others say to black conservatives who may find agreement and cohesiveness with this? It ain't nothing new. We've had this from the very beginning. Some would call it sellout. I wouldn't say that's always the case, although in some instances it is. In you some instances it's not, yep. Right, so you can have a legitimate disagreement. You can be a Booker T. Washington, but you've got a W.E.B. Du Bois who expressed a different viewpoint. W.E.B. Uh, du Bois said to, in response to Booker T. who said, lay down your pails where you are, have an agrarian ethos operating because that's the job you got. And no, we don't want any special pleading and privileges. Now, we agree with putting your pail down where you are, working hard, elbow grease, but we disagree with him when it comes to, quote, special pleading because we wouldn't have to plead specially if we weren't treated um, rather extraordinarily in terms of being excluded excluded from opportunity. So I say to black conservatives, look in the mirror, understand what it is. You're getting highly paid for a position that very few black people take. You're legitimating and justifying racist and anti-black practices that need to be examined. And thirdly, you benefited from it economically and politically. A Tim Scott, a Clarence Thomas. You have risen on the ladder of affirmative action, Mr. Thomas. You said so in 1983, only to lift that ladder up when others were seeking to climb it. That is the height of hypocrisy, and we need to call that out. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, always an honor and privilege to talk to you, my brother. Always appreciate the education. Thank you so much for your time. You know I appreciate you, my man. You take care of yourself. We definitely will talk more about this, and we'll talk soon. Much love to you, and thank you so much for this opportunity. All right.